It is with a great pleasure that I am here today to share with you my joy and indeed satisfaction in having achieved a landmark development, landmark progress in our pursuit of gross national happiness. You will find me not only speaking in the same vein as that of Kinga, um, Kinga's statement, remarks, but also uh, repeating what he has said, but you will forgive me as I do believe that they bear reputation. Three decades after His Majesty the Fourth, Drug Gyalpo, made his now world famous proclamation that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. I believe we are only beginning to unravel now the profundity of that seminal statement. In His Majesty's presence, one thing was always crystal clear to me. He chose his words very carefully and very deliberately. Each word and each phrase had meaning. Two examples are particularly relevant for what I now want to present. One, His Majesty could have chosen simply to talk about GNH and its benefits, but he very deliberately introduced and presented GNH in direct contrast to GNP. That means it is incumbent on us really to understand GNP or GDP as it has now become in international accounting system. If we really, that is, if we really want to understand GNH. How and why is GNH more important than GDP? And since GNP or GDP is actually an accounting system, what would GNH accounts look like? That is the question. Number two, His Majesty could have chosen to say that GNH is more important to the people of Bhutan than GNP. But again, he deliberately stated it as a universal truth that is therefore applicable to all peoples, not only relevant to Bhutan alone. This is crucial to understand. GNH matters not only for us. It's also, it is his gift to the entire world, human society. At a time of devastating environmental and cultural destruction globally, and the growing bankruptcy and collapse of our global economic order, the world desperately needs an alternative to the materialist, consumerist obsession that has wreaked such havoc. If we can demonstrate the practical viability of a working set of GNH, not GDP accounts, that chart a sane and balanced path forward, that will be one of the greatest contributions our little country can make to the wider world. Let's consider our current reality. The way the whole world now keeps its national accounts is enshrined in the official global system of national accounts that is accepted by the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, and by every government in the world. It's the reason GDP is comparable globally from London to Addis Ababa to Beijing to Buenos Aires. It is hard to rock that boat. But rock it we must, because that universally accepted system is based on untenable premises that have led governments to adopt some of the most bewildering, confusing, and destructive policies imaginable. And challenge it we must if we are serious about charting a sane and balanced GNH path forward, both for ourselves and for the world. The conventional and almost universally held belief globally is that more the economy grows 
as measured by GDP growth, the better off and more prosperous we are. But consider these. One, because the GDP only counts monetary market transactions, it mistakenly and misleadingly counts the depletion and degradation of our natural wealth as if it were economic gain, as it depletes. If we were to cut down all our forests in Bhutan, GDP would mushroom, explode, because GDP only counts the timber value of our forests once they are cut and sold at, in the market. GDP takes no account at all of the resources we have, in actual fact, installed. And so it entirely ignores the values of our standing trees. Yet, as we all know, and as our own constitution widely, <coughs> wisely recognizes, by vowing to keep most of our country under forest cover, our standing forests have immense value, protecting wildlife, biodiversity, watersheds, soils, and sacred places, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere, ameliorating the danger of landslides, and much more. Because those values are invisible in GDP, it's no wonder the world has accumulated a massive ecological debt that appears in no country's national accounts. Two, keeping accounts this way, as the world presently does, is like a factory owner or a farmer selling off all his machinery or seeds and counting it as profit, even though he'll have nothing to produce the next year. And yet, that's the way the world and even we here in Bhutan keep our national accounts. How absurd and foolish it seems. Three, there are so many examples of this absurdity. The more fossil fuels we burn and the more greenhouse gases we therefore emit, the more GDP grows. And therefore, according to conventional economic dogma, the better off we are supposed to be. The true cost of climate change remains invisible. For that matter, as we learned the hard way, watching the devastating oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the true costs of oil have never been reflected at the petrol pump, primarily because our present GDP-based accounting system ignores ecological benefits and costs. Indeed, it is sadly ironic that natural or human-induced induced disasters actually make GDP grow, simply because money is spent on repair and cleanup costs. Three, in fact, Many things that make GDP grow and that are therefore conventionally counted as positive signs of an expanding economy actually signify a decline in well-being. The more crime, pollution, war and sickness we have, for example, the more GDP grows, simply because money is being spent on prisons, police, weapons, drugs, cigarettes, and pollution cleanup costs to deal with the consequences of these ills. So long as you spend money, GDP will grow, regardless of whether that spending signifies an improvement or a decline in well-being. So simple GDP growth can't actually tell us if we are better off or not, or perhaps even if we are actually poor, or in fact, we are rich. And if GDP counts, in a true sense, eh? and if GDP counts as gain many questionable things that actually signify a decline in well-being, it entirely ignores a whole range of productive economic activity that genuinely does contribute to well-being. Ignoring it simply because no money is exchanged. And so volunteer work, community service, and the vital unpaid work done in the households count for nothing in GDP and the precious free time that we need to meditate 
garden and socialize with family and friends is completely valueless in GDP. And since equitable development is one of our core genius principles, it is noteworthy that GDP only measures the total amount of income a country produces and takes no account of how that income is shared. So the rich could be getting richer while the poor are getting poorer and GDP can still continue to rise with the growing inequities invisible in our standard accounts. I could go on listing many more fundamental flaws in our present reliance on GDP accounting methods which sadly send highly misleading signals to policymakers who continue to undermine timely action on climate change, disease prevention, and other crucial preventive actions. The total misguided reliance on GDP was never clearer than in the global economic collapse of 2008-9, when the world's leaders almost unanimously decided that the most important thing they could do was make the, the economy grow again. In other words, to stimulate GDP. The world is now paying the price of that one-sided approach as governments slide into devastating debt from which they may never re-emerge. All, all this leads me directly to the key announcement I want to make today. From now on, Bhutan will start accounting properly for all this country's precious wealth, including our natural wealth and our human, social, and crucial wealth, as Gunga mentioned. And we will stop focusing narrowly on our financial and manufactured wealth alone, as if that was all that mattered. Of course, we'll continue to count that as well. But from now on, we will be able to figure for the first time the true costs of economic activity, the costs of economic activity. And we'll be able to balance that activity with the proper accounting of our natural, human, and cultural wealth, which, of course, are key pillars of gross national happiness. In other words, we'll create balanced genius accounts for this country and thereby build the world's first comprehensive set of national accounts. We are in good company here. Since this is precisely the action recommended, among others, by the Stiglitz Commission that was appointed by the French President Sarkozy, we'll be the first country actually to do it in practice. And we are already drawing on some of the world's top expertise to do it well and credibly. It won't be easy. It will take time to do properly and fully, possibly several years, and there will be huge methodological challenges, like the inadequacy of money to properly describe the value of non-market activities, such as ecosystem services. But we have already begun work. Thanks to Drs. Costanza and Kobizuski here, by starting to train our national statisticians, key GNH Commission and Finance Ministry officials and others in the new concepts and methods. And even though we don't yet have complete GNH accounts already ready, we are today releasing the first natural, social, and human capital results of our new expanded accounting system. We have these ready. There is more information and three detailed reports in your press packages, you will get them. But here I'll just let you know in a nutshell, in a nutshell what these contain. Now, Dr. Kubisuski and Costanza have worked hard to give us the first ever estimate of the economic value of our country's natural capital, which provides, now listen to this, which provides 760 billion milton worth of ecosystem services every year. That's the worth of our natural capital. 
4.4 times more than our whole GDP. We never realized that. We always thought we were poor. Nearly 94% of that ecosystem service value is provided by our country's forests. And here is where our little country, Bhutan, LDC, poor, landlocked, and so on, is performing a huge service to the world. Because 53% of that value accrues to those beyond our borders. Free gifts, contributions. Why? Because our forests regulate climate, store carbon, and protect watersheds from which people in India benefit, people in Bangladesh benefit, <coughs> Nepal, China, and perhaps far beyond the South Asian region as well. And every year, our people generously give their voluntary time to help others. Cleaning up litter, repairing hangars, fighting fires, helping the sick, elderly, and disabled. Through their voluntary work, our people are not only living GNH in action, but providing extraordinarily valuable services to our country and economy. If we had to replace their voluntary work for pay, we now know it would cost us around 320 million multums every year. This is our first economic valuation of our social capital. And we have started valuing our human capital too, learning for the first time that the health care cost of alcohol abuse cost our health care system more than new 30 million per, per year, every year. And I feel that this is uh, a, a very you know, a conservative, modest estimate. In fact, it might, it might probably be far higher. Okay, so at least 30 million milterms, the cost of um, alcohol abuse. So for the first time, by starting to value our natural, social, human, and cultural capital, we are beginning to get a true sense of our rich and abundant national wealth. And also, of real costs like alcoholism, all of which are hidden in conventional GDP-based <coughs> accounts, unknown. The new information will help us tremendously in making policy based on real evidence and in creating a true GNH society. More than that, our new full benefit cost national accounts are really the foundation of a new GNH-based economic paradigm that at last, that at least, that will wean us off our consumerist economic growth addiction. And that will lead us to sustainable human happiness and the well-being of other life forms for which we are morally, ethically responsible. Some will undoubtedly ask, why is all this number crunching necessary. And others might also ask, aren't our genius indicators enough? <coughs> Nine domains, 72 variables. Well, first, the new measures matter simply because what we count and what we measure is what gets attention. If we don't count something, we think it has no value and it doesn't catch the attention of policymakers. And when we measure properly, we need both indicators and also accounts. We need both. Certainly, our genius indicators and the key data and information they provide are the essential basis for our proposed new genius accounts. We will always need these indicators for basic information about our country, and particularly as the important policy screening tool they have become. But they are not enough. Indicators and accounts are two entirely different, though fully complementary sets of measures. Indicators assess trends over time. Accounts assess value, what something is worth. A simple example, crime rates are an indicator. But accounts assess the economic costs of crime to society, 
Money we would save if we had no crime. Smoking rates are an indicator. While accounts assess the economic costs of smoking to our healthcare system due to higher rates of lung cancer, heart diseases, and <coughs> respiratory ailments. Money we'd save if no Bhutanese smoked. And so there are many such examples. In other words, our new GNH accounts will add a vital economic valuation dimension to our current indicator information. And that is essential for the simple reason that GDP is not an indicator, but an accounting system. If we are really to challenge the dominance of GDP-based thinking over our thinking and policy formation, then it is completely necessary to construct a broader and more accurate and comprehensive accounting system that properly accounts for the value of our natural, human, and cultural wealth. So long as budgets make the world go round, and so long as we ignore the true benefits and costs of our economic activity, indicators alone will not unseat the GDP from its present dominant role. And if we are to realize His Majesty's profound understanding that GNH is more important than GNP, then we have to take the next step in creating a true GNH society by building on an excellent indicator system to construct now a new set of GNH accounts. What does this new accounting system mean in practice? Let me give just a couple of examples. When we present our annual budgets, it means we will also start accounting for the health of our forests and other natural resources like water. And if we have had a bad year of forest fires, for example, then we'll need to count the consequences, forest loss, consequent forest loss as a depreciation of our natural wealth. Just as we present the figure depreciation when we account for the value of our built and manufactured capital. And if we plant trees, we'll count that as an investment in natural capital, just as we presently count for investment in our built capital. Or to take the human capital example, we will start fighting preventable illnesses as costs to the economy rather than misleadingly accounting for such expenditures as economic gain. We have started, for example, to calculate the cost of alcoholism to the economy and therefore to see preventive expenditures designed to reduce alcohol abuse as worthwhile investments in our human capital rather than simply as costs in our flawed current accounting system. In other words, our budgets and accounts won't look the same anymore. But they will definitely give us a much more accurate picture of how we are doing as a country and how prosperous we really are when we consider our total wealth and the full benefit and costs of our economic activity. Because they give us much more comprehensive information than our present GDP-based accounts, the new accounts will also make our policy making much more informed than it can possibly be when we rely on narrow market measures alone. The new accounts will point accurately to our hidden strength on which we need to build rather than taking them for granted. And they will identify weaknesses and investment requirements in our national wealth that are overlooked in conventional market measures. Perhaps most importantly, our new national accounts will finally reflect all the key pillars of gross national happiness so that we can truly chart a balanced path forward for the benefit of all our people. And in so doing, the new accounts will certainly be a gift to the world from which many other countries can learn. I truly believe that this major step on which we are embarking will not only help us understand more profoundly what His Majesty the Fourth King meant when he said GNH is more important than GNP, but in fact it will help fulfill His Majesty's vision of a happy and contented people.